to you all. A warm welcome to everyone joining us from around the world for this week's Health for the World Grand Rounds. It's an honor to be here and a pleasure to introduce our guest speaker today, Dr. Sam Galgano, who will be reviewing common pathologies and post-operative appearance of the urinary bladder and urethra. Dr. Galgano is a rising star with an already illustrious resume. He's our uh, section chief of abdominal imaging here at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. He's also an assistant professor um, in the division of molecular imaging and therapeutics as well. He's also co-chair of the Academy for Radiology and Biomedical Imaging Research Council of Early Career Investigators in Imaging. His research interests include novel radio tracer use in PET CT and PET MR for applications in GU and GI oncology. Not to mention, as a resident here at UAB, I can personally attest to his expertise and savvy as a medical educator. And with that, Dr. Galgano, take it away. Thank you, Austin, for the kind words. And I'm excited <clears throat> to be here talking to you all about some of my um, favorite topics. I really love GU radiology and was excited when given the opportunity to talk about the bladder and the urethra. And we're going to go over just some common pathology that you'll see on multiple different imaging modalities and the expected and unexpected postoperative appearance following some of the surgeries we see with them. I have no relevant disclosures to this lecture. Um, starting with bladder imaging, we're going to start by discussing the imaging modalities we use to image the bladder. We're going to discuss benign and malignant tumors of the urinary bladder. We will go over some common infectious or inflammatory conditions of the bladder. We will also talk about bladder trauma. And finally, we will briefly discuss the postoperative appearance of the urinary bladder following multiple common bladder surgeries. Moving on after that, we'll move on to the urethra, where we'll talk about normal urethral anatomy. And we'll talk about different advantages and disadvantages of ways to image the urethra. We will go through the Goldman classification, which outlines imaging and management uh, for traumatic urethral injuries. We'll talk about urethral stricture formation and management, and then summarize a variety of other urethral pathology. So starting with the bladder, um, the bladder is located in the pelvis. Obviously, the male and female bladder is slightly different owing to the uh, lack of a prostate in the females. And so you'll note here that the ureters insert at the base of the bladder up here. Um, the area where uh, the ureters kind of open, uh, kind of the ureteral orifice is the word you'll hear, um, and then it'll converge to the trigone, gets that name from being a triangle, where it turns into the bladder neck, the urethra, and ultimately the urethral sphincter. And you can see here differences. In general, the bladder is a muscle. It is a smooth muscle. It is lined by urethelium, and so that's why most of the pathology, especially cancerous, it, that arises in the bladder is urethelial in origin. But note that the muscles in the bladder also can give rise to different tumors. So how do we image the bladder? Um, first and most basic is a fluoroscopic cystogram, and what that entails is uh, usually a patient has an indwelling Foley catheter, or we have to place a Foley catheter, and through that we inject sterile iodinated contrast into the bladder that we could image under x-ray. Um, this allows us to get real-time evaluation of the bladder, which can be helpful in evaluating for bladder leaks. Um, but, uh, and is just, uh, you know, radiologist dependent, you could either record the images or just take spot images of the pelvis. Contrast that to a CT cystogram, which is essentially the same thing as a fluoroscopic cystogram, but instead of taking x-ray images, after the bladder gets full, we just take a CT of the pelvis. And these are frequently done, at least at our institution, and a lot of trauma patients to evaluate for bladder injury. We'll get a, a scan before we fill their bladder, we'll get a scan after they fill their bladder, and you can help find the area of bladder leak. A CT urogram um, can be used to image the bladder. It is a different uh, kind of imaging. This is typically involves imaging the entire urinary tract from the kidneys down. And there are a number of different ways we can do this. We can split the bolus of contrast, or we can just do multiphasic CT to evaluate the kidneys, the urinary bladder, and the ureters on portal venous and excretory phases. Um, ubiquitous pretty much everywhere is ultrasound. Ultrasound is excellent for kind of a screening modality to look at the bladder. A, a key advantage in bladder imaging is the ability to evaluate ureteral jets, or we can see if the ureters are open and patent as we see the urine pass into the bladder. We watch the bladder real time. 
And most importantly, it's quick and easy to image. MRI is infrequently used uh, as far as our institution and pretty much in the United States, but can be used for T-staging of bladder cancers where it may be useful kind of for surgical planning to get an MRI ahead of time to know what we're gonna do. And then finally, nuclear medicine. Um, nuclear medicine avoiding cystourethrograms, which is similar to a fluoroscopic cystic, uh, cystogram can be performed. Uh, there are some advantages in regards to radiation dose. These are typically done on infants and then can be used to diagnose vesicourethral reflux. And they can be done with any number of radio tracers, including technetium sulfur collide, protectinate, or DTPA. So bladder cancer is the first and you know, most common thing everyone thinks about. So what, what does bladder cancer look like? So this on the left is an image from a CT urogram. We see the excreted iodinated contrast in the bladder forming this layer. And here we see on the left side of the bladder posteriorly a small polypoid mass that protrudes into the urinary bladder, a filling defect. And on pathology, this was found to be a low grade transitional cell or urethelial cell carcinoma. Contrast this to, this is just a standard portal venous phase CT. Here, even without contrast in the bladder, we see a Foley catheter in the bladder. We see a large enhancing frond-like polypoid mass extending into the bladder lumen. And the pathology on this ended up being invasive squamous cell carcinoma, which is somewhat unusual in the scheme of bladder cancers. Which, going on to MRI, uh, this is a T2 weighted MR image of the pelvis. Again, we don't need the iodinated contrast on the T2 weighted images to create contrast with the bladder where the urine is naturally T2 bright. But again, we see the same sort of thing where we see a small polypoid mass. And then on the post contrast images, analogous to the uh, the uh, CT urogram we looked at before, we see this filling defect with the contrast in the urinary bladder. And this ended up being an invasive, a transitional cell or urethelial carcinoma. So uh, there'll be a few questions logged in here. You feel free to type the answers in the chat, but uh, I won't expect audience participation. Uh, the first question is, what is the most pa common pathologic subtype of bladder cancer? Is it transitional cell, squamous cell, adenocarcinoma, or sarcoma? And so take a minute and think about that. Um, and if you don't know, feel free to guess or feel free to remain quiet. That's okay. So the most common kind of bladder cancer, subtype of bladder cancer is transitional cell or urethelial carcinoma. And that accounts for more than 90% of bladder cancers. So if you're gonna guess what kind of pathology is this bladder cancer, Transitional cell or urethelial is the, just statistically the most common and probably a good guess. Adenocarcinomas can form in the urinary bladder. They account for approximately 1% of bladder cancers. And if you're taking a test or you're, you're being quizzed on it, usually the, the characteristic test word or clinical feature you'll be given is these can arise in the setting of urachal remnants, which is, you know, the urachus connects basically your umbilicus to your bladder and eventually closes after you're born. Um, and in some people, they can have either a completely patent urachus or just a urachal remnant, which is kind of a, a half-closed urachus. And this is where adenocarcinomas can form. Alternatively, squamous cell carcinomas can form in the urinary bladder, like I just showed you. This is 1% to 2% of bladder cancers. And, and key test words for this would be these occur in the setting of schistosomiasis infections, which are uncommon in the United States, but more common worldwide. And in the setting of that, you can see calcifications of the urinary bladder. So the next question is for patients with transitional cell carcinoma bladder cancer, invasion of what layer of the bladder determines their treatment algorithm? Is it invasion of the mucosa? Is it invasion of the muscularis or muscular layer? Is it invasion of the serosal layer? Or is it invasion of the adjacent structures next to the bladder? see a couple votes for serosa. That's good. So invasion of the serosa is important, but really bladder cancer is sort of dichotomized or split into two categories. And we refer to that as non-muscle invasive bladder cancer and muscle invasive bladder cancer. And non-muscle invasive bladder cancer is 75 to 85% of the cases. And these cases are treated typically with cystoscopy where they resect the tumors 
transurethrally with a with a cystoscope, and then occasionally will administer intravesical BCG. So these are treated sort of as local tumors, locally recurrent tumors, kind of treated as they come back. Whereas mus once there is invasion of the muscular layer, and this is in about a quarter of cancers, um, these patients will have to undergo cystectomy, chemotherapy, and or radiation. And, it, and up to a quarter of these muscle invasive cases will have positive pelvic adenopathy. So again, the most important thing, and this is usually a pathological feature, is is there invasion into the muscular layer? Invasion outside the muscular layer into the serosa, into the adjacent structures is all important from a surgical standpoint, but really the invasion of the muscular layer is what determines the treatment paradigm for these patients with bladder cancer. So not every bladder tumor is malignant. Um, there are a bunch of benign bladder tumors. The most common benign bladder tumor is what's called the papilloma. Um, you could get papillomas in other parts of your body. And interestingly, on imaging, they look identical to low-grade non-invasive transitional cell carcinoma. So they look like small polyploid masses. They protrude into the bladder lumen. You know, usually if we see them on a CT scan or a fluor scan or, or really any scan, will raise concern for bladder cancer, but ultimately these patients have to go to cystoscopy with resection. And the pathologist is gonna be the one who determines is this a malignant bladder tumor or is this a benign bladder papilloma? Some other bladder tumors that can also be present that are benign, less common are leiomyomas. Like I said, the bladder is made of muscle, smooth muscle. So you can get leiomyomas like you can get in the uterus. These tumors in the bladder will originate from the muscular layer of the wall, makes sense they're made of muscle. And these tend to have smooth margins, whereas you know some of the more aggressive tumors, especially that squamous cell I showed before, had kind of these polypoid or frond-like margins. Um, these will be very smooth and rather non-aggressive looking. Interestingly, you can also have endometriomas or endometriosis that involves the urinary bladder. If it's intraluminal, it typically requires that the patient will have been instrumented or, or you know, had a cystoscopy or a Foley catheter or something uh, in the past. But if it's extraluminal, frequently these implant on the serosal surface of the urinary bladder. So what do those look like? Here's a sagittal T2 weighted image of the pelvis. So the fluid in the bladder is bright. And here we see a very smooth, well-circumscribed, T2 hypo-intense lesion arising from the muscular layer of the bladder wall, and this was biopsied and proven to be a leiomyoma, so a benign bladder tumor. Here's another sagittal T2-weighted image of the pelvis, and you can see underneath it a sagittal T1, so uh, blood products that you see in endometriosis tend to be bright on T1-weighted imaging. So here we have multiple T1 bright sort of lesions along the posterior surface of the bladder, and I admit it can be challenging to figure out if they're intraluminal in the bladder lumen or extraluminal, but this is a patient with biopsy proven endometriosis that's involving their bladder. And you can see these bright T, sort of the T1 brightness is, is really characteristic for endometriosis, particularly in the pelvis. So while we're talking about endometriosis, uh, if a patient with known endometriosis presents with this X-ray and active cyclical pelvic pain, which is typical of endometriosis, does anyone have an idea of what the diagnosis is? This is sort of a, a rare entity, but is a, we call it an ant mini, something that's fairly pathognomonic in this case. So, this is a chest x-ray. We've obviously ventured far out of the pelvis. Um, this is the person's right lung. It looks well aerated. This is the person's left lung, which is completely collapsed and has a large air collection around the left lung. So this is a large pneumothorax. And if it's associated with endometrial deposits in the chest, it's what's referred to as a catamenial pneumothorax. And the, this is a pneumothorax basically that is associated with, with the menstrual cycle and will recur spontaneously, particularly in young women who have endometriosis. The etiology of it's not totally known how the endometrial deposits get up there. There's a bunch of different theories, but again, in a patient who's young with spontaneous recurrent pneumothoraces, this should be a diagnostic consideration. Moving on to bladder infection. So uh, what does infection look like in the bladder? So on the left is a pretty typical image of cystitis or just bladder inflammation. And this is a non-contrast CT of the pelvis. We see stranding surrounding the bladder lumen and bladder wall. So it looks inflamed. 
We see wall thickening like we see in other parts of the body when there's inflammation. So this is pretty typical uncomplicated cystitis. And there's a number, this can be infectious, this could be you know, from radiation, it could be any number of reasons, but this bladder definitely looks inflamed. Contrast that to this, this is a specific kind of emphysematous cystitis, uh, cystitis called emphysematous cystitis, and this is a more serious problem. And instead of it just looking inflamed, there is actual air. You can see here with lung windows on the bottom image, air within the bladder wall, not just in the bladder lumen. And so this, this, you know, is not as benign necessarily as just simple infection or inflammation. And so this is an important finding to look for and describe uh, to help guide the clinicians you're helping. And so, you know, we won't spend a lot of time on this, but think about what are some risk factors, if anyone knows about any risk factors for emphysematous cystitis. Probably the most common, at least in the United States, is diabetes, and that accounts for about 50% of cases. Um, and you can see here an ultrasound image. This is different. This is a bladder ultrasound in a patient with emphysematous cystitis. And just like other parts of the body, when we ultrasound and we have air, we get this kind of dirty shadowing behind it. And so you see here, you know, it's very difficult to see behind these uh, hyperechoic structures here in the bladder wall. Um, Females are more affected by emphysematous cystitis than males in a two to one ratio. And then importantly, at least at our in, you know, quaternary care center, uh, we have a lot of immunocompromised patients um, and patients with neurogenic bladders and transplant recipients. So anything that can compromise your immune state may also present with bladder uh, emphysematous cystitis. These patients may describe new materia or passing air during their urine. And this, this infection in general is due to a gas forming organism. And if treated and if left untreated and severe could lead to bladder rupture. So as you see the, you know, unlike regular inflammation, this is an important finding to, to discuss. And some cases are treated surgically and some cases are treated medically. And that's not really for this lecture, but, um, but it is still important. Now we have a lot of trauma that comes through our spot uh, at UAB in, in Alabama and um, Bladder trauma is a frequent trauma, especially in the setting of pelvic trauma. So these left images, we see what's called an open book pelvis. We have widening of the pubic symphysis and the left sacroiliac joint. And this is on a CT cystogram. And we see here contrast in the bladder and then bright contrast extending outside the urinary bladder into the pre-vesical space. You can see this is an x-ray from the same patient. Contrast is tracking into the extra peritoneal spaces. We don't see contrast outlining any bowel loops on this image, but contrast to the CT cystogram image over here where we have another open book pelvis, just like we did in the first case. But instead of the contrast extending in the pre-vesical space, we now see contrast outlining multiple loops of bowel in the pelvis. And so, the delineation of an intraperitoneal versus extraperitoneal uh, bladder rupture is an important delineation to make because the treatment is totally different. So if we go through this first case, what was the treatment of choice for this patient with contrast extravasating into the extraperitoneal space? Does this patient go to surgery or is this patient treated conservatively is the big question. We will go. So extraperitoneal bladder ruptures are about 85% of bladder ruptures, and they're usually due to, like I showed you, pelvic fractures or penetrating injury. The treatment for extraperitoneal bladder ruptures is typically conservative, which involves a Foley catheter placement and allows the bladder to heal on its own. So again, if you see contrast tracking in the extraperitoneal spaces, it's important to mention that specifically because that will prompt them to place a Foley catheter and not take the patient to the operating room, which is the treatment of choice for an intraperitoneal bladder rupture. So intraperitoneal, less common, usually about 15% of cases, is usually caused by a, a full bladder that receives a direct blow to it, and the bladder essentially pops into the peritoneal cavity, and that's when you'll see contrast outlining those bowel loops. And the treatment of choice for this is surgical repair. So these patients go to the operating room typically the same day. Just briefly, as we're finishing up the bladder, um, some common appearances of some common bladder surgeries. So bladder augmentation um, 
Bladder augmentation is a procedure that's used to kind of help people with overactive bladders, especially in the pediatric population. And, you know, not getting into the specifics of it, what you should know as a radiologist is these bladders often look very large, very irregular, and very, very funny shaped. And they can look all different kinds of ways. This is just one way. But you could see here in AP and a lateral cystogram image how this bladder does not look round like our normal bladder does. This is kind of globular. It almost looks like a snowman on the AP view. So again, if you see a funny looking bladder, especially uh, you know with no history, the first thing I would question is this if this patient had a bladder augmentation. Contrast that to what's called the Boari flap or you know Boari flap and psoas hitch are two different bladder surgeries. But basically what they do is they resect the distal you'll see uh, on the next test question what part they resect and then they reconstruct the connection between the bladder and the ureter here with the tubularized section of the bladder and this is called the boari flap so the bladder almost looks pulled up to one side and so as i was alluding to both the psoas hitch and boari flap are used during surgical repair or removal of what part of the urinary tract. Is it the bladder, the distal ureter, the prostate, or the proximal ureter? And so we're talking about bladder because the, you know, these surgeries affect the fluoroscopic and CT appearance of the bladder, but are these actually bladder surgeries? Um, and the answer is no. So the, the, these are both surgeries that involve removal of the distal ureter. So typically if someone has a diseased section of ureter, whether it's a stricture or something else, they remove the distal ureter and then basically stretch the bladder up to connect the ureter back to the, to the urinary bladder. So again, as I said, bladder augmentation, variety of appearances, the goal is to reduce bladder pressure. This is usually done in childhood when high blood pressure leads to incontinence. And this is usually in patients with spina bifida or neurogenic bladder. Um, so it's the most common place you'll see bladder augmentation. So as hitch is again, the distal left, uh, distal ureter is diseased and removed. And so the bladder gets freed, stretched and tacked to the psoas muscle. And that's where the name psoas hitch comes from. And then the Boari flap is essentially a more extreme version of the psoas hitch used for longer segments of ureteral resection. And so that is what this image looked like initially where we have a long tubularized section of the bladder instead of the bladder just looking slightly pulled up towards the ureter it's tubularized and connected. So to summarize, we're almost done with your, we're basically done with bladder at this point. Key points from the bladder portion of the lecture, the most common bladder cancer is transitional cell carcinoma. It is important to distinguish non-muscle invasive from muscle invasive. And then if you have other cancer types, especially on a test, you will usually have a key history provided. Remember that not all tumors in the bladder are malignant, and we may need to biopsy or resect them to differentiate a benign or malignant tumor. The key risk factors for emphysematous cystitis are diabetes and immunosuppression. An intraperitoneal bladder rupture is surgically treated, while an extraperitoneal rupture is conservatively treated. And just be familiar with some expected postoperative appearances of the urinary bladder, knowing that each patient's surgical history is different. Moving on to the urethra. So the bladder empties into the urethra. And the first question is on this retrograde urethrogram, which is uh, done in the patient's supine in the trauma patient, can you identify the segments of the urethra? And I won't ask anyone to identify them. But going over, there are multiple segments of the urethra. There's the penile urethra, which is in the penis, um, the bulbar urethra, the membranous urethra, and the prostatic urethra. And the prostatic urethra obviously connects to the bladder neck. There's what's known as the vera montanum, which is a focal sort of dilation within the prostate. Sometimes you can see a focal filling defect within it. It's just a normal structure. And so it's just something to be familiar with so you don't mistake it for pathology. Knowledge of the sections of the urethra, segments of the urethra, especially the male urethra is very important as where the pathology occurs, one can be characteristic based on location and two, the treatment can be dictated as by where these things are. This is from a, a Netter textbook on a sagittal image. And, and again, the male urethra, we see the penile urethra, or they call it the spongy urethra, the membranous urethra, right where it crosses the urogenital diaphragm, and the prostatic urethra up here. The bulbar urethra is kind of right before the membranous urethra, right about here. 
So what are some anatomic mimics of pathology in the urethra that we expect? Um, so this can be from a variety of things and can be associated with pathology or just be benign. You can see fillings of what are known as the glands of Latre. They almost look like small little pseudo diverticulas sticking off the urethra. It's important to know what they are uh, so we don't call them a urethral leak. And the same goes for retrograde filling. Occasionally you'll see it of Cowper's glands. Um, and again, these, these as you do more urethral imaging, you'll, you'll learn to differentiate these from, from saying something that looks like a leak or something like that. This is another image with a lot of prominent glands of Latre. And this patient actually has filling of some of their prostate uh, gland. And this, you know, you can get some funny looks, especially after people have had transurethral prostate resections. So keep in mind, know your anatomy, know where you're looking at and know what surgery they've had most importantly, if that's what you're looking for. So we'll start with urethral trauma because it's probably the most tested kind of uh, topic, especially uh, on radiology boards. And so the, the question that I'm asking here is what type of injury is depicted on this retrograde urethrogram? And so this is a, basically using the Goldman classification. Is it a type one, two, three, or four? And if it's a type two, do they have a disrupted urogenital diaphragm or do they have an intact urogenital diaphragm? So we see retrograde filling of the urethra. We see all this irregular stuff up here. Clearly looks extravasated, like it's not in the bladder or urethra. And you know the question is, how far down does it extend? And so this is a type two membranous urethral injury with an intact urogenital diaphragm. So I basically have put the urogenital diaphragm on with a green arrow. So this most frequently occurs in the setting of trauma with pelvic fractures, and it can be treated with either suprapubic tube placement or primary realignment. That's true of many urethral injuries. The indication for doing a retrograde urethrogram in the setting of trauma typically is blood at the urethral meatus. So if there's blood uh, if coming out of the, of the penis, um, typically that will prompt us to do a fluoroscopic retrograde urethrogram prior to them placing a Foley catheter to ensure that the urethra is not disrupted. Um, of note that the disruption can be complete, which that becomes very obvious when the urethra is completely disrupted. It could be partial where it's leaking, but you can still track the entire urethral lumen back to the bladder. Or you could have a contusion, which is unfortunate because we, those are radiographically normal. So that, that is not a diagnosis we can make, but the, the truth is that a contusion is treated very conservatively. So, so it's not necessarily important that we know is the urethra normal or is there a urethral contusion? But complete and partial disruptions are important. So how do we do and what is a retrograde urethrogram if you've never done one? So a retrograde urethrogram is considered to be the best initial study for evaluating urethral injuries, urethral strictures, and pelvic fistulas or urethral fistulas. So what we do is we prep the, the external meatus, so the tip of the penis, we prep it with betadine or in standard sterile fashion with whatever you use. We either insert some kind of Foley catheter, or if the patient has a Foley catheter, we insert a small pediatric feeding tube alongside the, cat the indwelling urinary catheter into the urethra. Um, and especially if you're doing one around the indwelling catheter, you always have to use a very small tube. Um, there are places where if you do put a Foley in that they do inflate the balloon. We tend to at our institution not do that. But we place the patient in a 45 degree angle supine. So we're, they're oblique 45 degrees to us. That allows for the maximal exposure of, of the urethra and, and the best images. The penis is placed laterally over the proximal thigh and you, pr you provide moderate traction so that there's no redundancy or curvature in the urethra. So you do have to to pull a little bit, and that's important too for making sure there's no leaking of contrast as you inject. And then while you do that, approximately 20 to 30 milliliters of high osmolar contrast is injected under fluoroscopy and spot radiographs are obtained. Ideally, we like to see contrast passing all the way into the urinary bladder uh, in patients with strictures or, or very high pelvic muscle tone. That can sometimes be challenging to get it past the prostate. So. Uh, so ideally you see it go into the bladder, but I, I'll admit that that is not a, a certainty and that is not always possible. Going back to the Goldman classification, which we talked about in that question. So there are five, or five types with a couple that have subtypes, but type one is a stretching injury. These can be very challenging to diagnose truthfully um, because depending on the positioning of the patient, some patients urethra may look stretched, but in reality, the urologist thinks it's normal. 
But type two is an injury of the prostatic urethra with contrast extravasation above the urogenital diaphragm. And type three is a disruption of the membranous urethra where contrast extravasates into and below the urogenital diaphragm. Uh, disruption involving the bladder neck is a type four and that's with extra peritoneal contrast extravasation. There's a four A, which is a bladder base rupture that does not involve the bladder neck. And there we see contrast extending along the urethra, periurethral contrast extravasation. And then type five is disruption of the anterior urethra. This is most common in the setting of penetrating trauma where we see contrast extravasation in the anterior urethra below the urogenital diaphragm. Um, and we'll look at images of all this. So this is a, a type one where we have a, a stretched urethra. You can see it looks somewhat elongated and irregular. I'll admit this is somewhat technical and can be challenging diagnosis to make. This is a type two where we start seeing it extravasate above the urogenital diaphragm, but not below. This is a type three where we now have extra peritoneal uh, contrast below the urogenital diaphragm. This is that type four where we're seeing it extravasate at the bladder neck right here where the urethra inserts into the bladder. And this is a type five right here, an injury to the anterior urethra where clearly in the mid portion of the penile urethra, there's a large leak. So how is urethral trauma managed? Well, at least in the United States, this is dictated by, is the patient stable? And if the answer is no, then the immediate answer is to place a suprapubic tube or a urinary catheter. And basically do not delay life-saving intervention. Um, they can place suprapubic tubes if patients are going to the operating room for pelvic fixation of their pelvic fractures. And they say to avoid repeated attempts at a urinary catheter placement. Um, so, if catheter placement fails and the patient's unstable, suprapubic tube either before or at the time of surgery. So is the patient stable? If the patient is stable, um, the vast majority of these patients will have a suprapubic tube placed anyway, and they will elect to delay the reconstruction for several weeks after their trauma. There is a theoretical risk of increased, uh, severe, increased risk of severe stricture with this. Um, but again, this is the modality of choice and the algorithm of choice in most centers. Contrast that to the suprapubic tube placement with primary realignment. So this typically involves a, a specialized center with a dedicated sort of reconstructive urologist or trauma urologist that is familiar with how to do these procedures because if there's a complete disruption, these can uh, be quite uh, tricky to reconstruct. So there is a theorized less risk of severe strictures, but may require two urologists in the OR and is recommended to be performed the first few days after injury. So on to some urethral surgeries. Um, so there's three main urethral surgeries that we see postoperatively. And this is the first one is called an augmented urethroplasty. And what is an augmented urethroplasty? So it's also called a substitution urethroplasty, and this can be in a single stage procedure or a two stage procedure. These are typically done for you know, long segment strictures, penile urethral strictures and panurethral strictures. And so what do they do is this is the stricture part of the urethra. What they'll do is remove it. And instead of just reconnecting the urethra uh, to make up the distance between some of what they've resected, they use a donor graft tissue to, to sort of help ease the tension and these donor grafts typically can come from the buccal mucosa, or the, so the, the mucosa from the inside of your mouth, um, or they can come from the foreskin. Um, the donor flaps can either be taken from the penile skin or de epithelialized scrotal skin, but it is imperative when they use some of this tissue that they use non hair bearing skin, because if they do, they can have uh, hair growth within the urethra, which has been reported, and that can lead to stone formation, recurrent UTI and lower urinary tract symptoms. So what can happen after an augmented urethroplasty? Uh, you can see penile curvature. If the tension is not relieved appropriately, patients can have erectile dysfunction like with any penile surgery. They can obviously get recurrent strictures. They can develop a diverticulum and they can also develop a urethra cutaneous fistula. So a fistula with the skin surface. So on to strictures. Um, what is the most likely etiology for this stricture? Here we have a retrograde urethrogram. Um, we see a very tight stricture here in the, in the urethra. And so there's some other clues here on the image. Where is the, what is the most likely etiology for this patient's strictures? Any guesses in the chat? 
trauma. Yeah, that's exactly it. Um, so you can see all the surgical fixation hardware from pelvic fixation. And yeah, so trauma. Trauma is one of the more common causes of urethral stricture. So this is a post-traumatic bulbar urethral stricture right here with the red arrow. This is most commonly due to trauma. And typically we refer to this as a straddle injury where uh, you know the, the urethra hits up against the pelvis and that's the site of trauma and typically occurs at the level of the pubic bone. So these almost always occur in a characteristic spot in the sort of the, the bulbar urethra. Um, and then also if these patients have Foley catheters placed at the time of injury and they're in there for a long time, you could see uh, uh, strictures worsened by indwelling Foley catheter placement. So, but again, bulbar urethral strictures the most common cause is trauma and that's most common is straddle injury. So what is a stricture? A stricture is a general term anywhere in the body that's fibrous scarring that causes narrowing. And in this case, the urethral stricture is scarring of the urethra caused by collagen and fibroblast pr proliferation. And the contraction of the scar reduces the width of the urethral lumen. And that's what leads to symptoms from these anterior urethral strictures may be from inflammatory conditions. And we'll talk about some of these infectious urethritis or BXO. Trauma like we've already discussed or iatrogenic trauma or instrumentation or rarely congenital, whereas posterior urethral strictures can um, either be from uh, trauma or prior surgery. And these can be from uh, transurethral resection of the prostate or open radical prostatectomy, where, we're, where they're operating on the site of the prostatic urethra, if that makes sense. So uh, we have a, a fairly unique way of evaluating some of these strictures that we've written up. Um, and that is to combine a voiding cysto urethrogram and a retrograde urethrogram at the exact same time to evaluate stricture formation. And this is a patient that underwent both. And so why would we do this? This allows for exact characterization of the length of the stricture and assessment of bladder neck incompetence. So how do we do it? We fill the bladder. The patients almost always have our suprapubic tube. So we start filling the bladder like we would for a VCUG through the suprapubic tube. Once the bladder gets relatively full and the patient feels like they may have to void, we then perform the retrograde urethrogram. Uh, and as the stricture is visualized, have the patient bear down or try to void. And what happens is you see the contrast extend down as far down as it's gonna go to the stricture. So now contrast this initial retrograde urethrogram where we see obliteration of the urethra right here when we do a combined VCUG and a retrograde urethrogram, we now know exactly how long and to what extent this urethra is strictured. And we use this barium tablet to give us a reference point as to how big it is. Um, so this can be really helpful. This can give your surgeon some really nice pictures so that they know what they're dealing with when it comes time to plan their surgery. So another urethral surgery, this is a more simple urethral surgery, is what's called an anastomonic urethroplasty. And this is also called excision and primary anastomosis. So this is done for a relatively short segment stricture or stenosis in the bulbar or membranous urethra that basically they can cut it out and hook it back up with a tension-free anastomosis. So if there's tension on the anastomosis, that's when they start using the donor site like that first augmented urethroplasty we looked at. Um, this is basically cut the stricture out and hook everything back up. A contraindication to this is a stricture in the penile urethra because if you do this, this can lead to postoperative penile curvature, which is undesirable. Um, and so prior to the procedure, they, they require at least four weeks of urethral rest to minimize the inflammation. Some take it all the way up to three months. And similar to uh, the last uh, urethroplasty, it's the same complications, curvature, erectile dysfunction, recurrent stricture, diverticulum, and urethral cutaneous fistula formation. A postoperative uh, retrograde urethrogram or VCUG um, it is expected to have some mild luminal irregularity at the site of where they did the urethroplasty. What we're really looking for here is, especially if there's a catheter still in place, a Foley catheter or a penile catheter, we're not looking for residual stenosis. We're not looking for, for sort of, we're looking for leak. We're looking for contrast that is extending outside of the urethral or bladder lumen. Um, so the catheters, they keep them in place typically postoperatively for two to three weeks. And then at that point, we repeat a rug uh, to see there's no leak. And at that point, if there's no leak, they usually will remove these catheters. Um, there is some uh, literature that suggests these complications we talked about maybe slightly more common with a substitution urethral plastic compared to EPA or 
the simple sort of excise and, and hook it back up, but but it's it's not well uh, sort of established in the literature. Here are some things it should not look like on your post-operative urethroplasty rugs. So here we obviously we have a rug and we see a lot of contrast extravasation down into the pelvis and perineum. And so this was just a urethral leak. This did not extend to the skin surface, but sometimes as you're doing the rug, you will start, patient will either complain of fluid coming out of them or you'll note the fluid coming out of them. And this was actually a urethrocutaneous fistula here. So again, both we would, we would see clear extraluminal contrast. And this, this is important to note because typically what they'll do before they go in and reoperate is just leave the Foley catheter in for extra period of time to see if it'll heal on its own. On to the infectious inflammatory category. We're moving along pretty nicely. Um, what is the diagnosis here? We see sort of irregular panurethral stricturing. Um, and, you know, we'll talk about all these entities, but this is a pretty characteristic uh, look for BXO or lichen sclerosis. And so this is diffuse long segment stricturing of the urethra, typically affects the penile and bulbar urethra. Important to know is it does have a strong association of squamous cell carcinoma. So, so it's an important finding. They don't exactly know pathologically what causes it, but it is, is hypothesized that this is a chronic lymphocyte mediated skin disease that affects the urethra. But again, this pan diffuse long segment stricturing is, is pretty characteristic of what's now known as lichen sclerosis, but was previously noted or known as BXO. Someone asked me a question in the chat and I see it. I'm glad we got to it. Um, you can use ultrasound to evaluate urethral strictures, especially, uh, you know, this requires that you ultrasound the parts of the urethra that you could see. So very helpful in the penile urethra as you get more posterior visualization of the urethra can be more challenging. Um, you know, the nice part about this is you see the focal stricture, you see the focal fibrosis, you see the thickening of, of the fibrotic layer and you kind of get a better idea. And so what they do is this is done by installing basically sterile ultrasound gel retrograde into the urethral uh, lumen. And so that way you get a better depiction of real time ultrasound of what the, what the urethral stricture looks like. Some report that this is more accurate than retrograde, uh, retrograde urethrograms. And the sensitivity for an anterior urethral stricture is very high, 94%. Um, spongiofibrosis is a specific, you know, cause of urethral strictures and can be a critical determinant in the choice of surgical procedures. And sonourethrography has been proven uh, to really help in sort of determining if spongiofibrosis is the etiology of the patient's stricture. Some other classic infectious or inflammatory looks to the urethra. One is gonococcal urethritis, so that's associated with a uh, gonorrhea infection. Patients typically will have purulent urethral discharge. And again, what we see is some irregular urethral narrowing, several centimeters long. And the one thing that you will see in this setting is gonococcal, if you start seeing a lot of glands of Littre, like we talked about in the beginning of the urethral segment, this is kind of a, a red flag, is this patient have a gonococcal infection? And again, they can check labs and urinalysis to see or and swab the patient to see if they have gonorrhea. Uh, but this glands of Littre can kind of, it's non-specific, but it does set off alarm bells that this could be gonococcal urethritis. Contrast that to condylomas, and this is an HPV infection, like we get in condylomas in other parts of the bodies. And what we get are these soft sessile squamous papillomas, and they can get them on the penile glands, the penile shaft, and the precipice of the penis. Urethral involvement is fairly rare, sort of ranging from half a percent to 5%. But what you can see is these multiple papillary filling defects within the urethral lumen, like it's outlined here. And so it looks like you'd imagine a papilloma to look at just, it can just rarely affect the inside of the urethra. The final type of urethral surgery we're going to briefly discuss is what's called an onlay urethroplasty. And this is a slightly different sort of operation mentally to think about, they use this for very long strictures. And interestingly, it does not involve the resection of any port, any portion of the urethra. So this can be performed on either the dorsal or ventral side of the urethra. And basically what it is, is there's the stricture. So they do a stricturotomy, like the middle image, to make a sort of relieve the tension, relieve the narrowing. And what they're left with is this kind of large gap as they make the stricturotomy. 
And what they do is then instead of trying to remove it, they just kind of widen the urethral lumen by putting a donor flap on it to sort of reconstruct it and make it the lumen larger again. Um, and so that's how they retubularize the urethra. Um, the diameter of the new lumen should be approximately 10 millimeters to allow the flow of urine. Um, that's just recommended. We don't routinely measure ours postoperatively. Again, they're just more interested is their leak or not. Um, rarely strictures can be endoscopically dilated as well. Um, and so you see here some cystoscopy images or urethroscopy images of a focal stricture that was pre and post dilation. Um, they can do these in tandem with what's called a direct visualization internal urethrotomy so they can make a small incision on the urethral stricture uh, while they're watching it to make sure that they're, they're not extending that incision too deep. This can be used for those who are not suitable for urethral surgery or who have emergent acute urinary retention. Um, they basically need to have a short segment bulbar urethral stricture to be even be considered for this unless they're a, a non-surgical candidate and this is almost a palliative uh, surgery. They do not recommend this for the penile urethra um, and repeated dilation is contraindicated unless the patient is again, not a surgical candidate. Like other things, you can similar complications, although with this one, there's a higher risk of bleeding, a higher risk of infection, obviously, because you're instrumenting the, ureth the urethra with the scope and the device. You can perforate the urethra. You can actually cause a rectal injury uh, depending on you know where the urethra is that you're you sort of making your incision. If it's the posterior part that's closer to the rectum, uh, if, if the incision goes ex extensively outside the urethra, you can cause a rectal injury. Um, on briefly to some other uh, more rare things. And so here is a MR image, couple T2, T1 pre-contrast, T1 post-contrast. And the question for this is what pathologic subtype uh, is this urethral cancer most likely to be? And so the hint is on the images. And just like the bladder cancers, there's some, some code words that for urethra um, can lead you to pick one of these answers over the other. Um, so the answer is obviously like the bladder, we'll have squamous cell, adenocarcinoma, urethelial, spindle cell. So this is actually a T2 weighted image of a female pelvis. And what we see is a T2 bright structure here in the midline with a, what looks like enhancing filling defect inside this T2 bright structure. So what this actually is, is a female urethral diverticulum with a mass inside of it. And so if you have a female urethral diverticulum with a mass that arises inside of it, statistically on tests, what the answer they want you to pick is adenocarcinoma. So this is a urethral diverticulum adenocarcinoma that was biopsy proven. In urethral diverticula, it's the most common subtype, accounting for 60% of cancers. And that's because they have urinary stasis in these diverticula, they get recurrent infections, they get recurrent inflammation, and that predisposes them to develop cancer. But that cancer can also be urethelius or squamous cell. Typically for this, we use MRI to diagnose it. MRI tends to be the diagnostic algorithm of choice for urethral diverticula. You can ultrasound them. So uh, ultrasound is also an option, but you don't get the contrast necessarily with most ultrasound. Um, whereas here you'll see the heterogeneously enhancing mass within the diverticula. On ultrasound, you certainly would see the stuff on the inside. It would just be challenging to know, is it, is it just sort of stones or, or debris or is it an enhancing mass? And so urethral diverticula are more common in women, and that's due to the coexistence of stress urinary incontinence and urinary tract infection. These can be single or multiple, unilocular or multi-compartmental. This is an image on MRI, axial T2 weighted image of the pelvis. We see some layering kind of T2 intermediate signal fluid. Here's a CT image from the same patient. We see the cystic lesion surrounding the urethra. So this is a pretty characteristic look for a urethral diverticula. They can have big necks, they can have small necks. Uh, they're usually posterior lateral to the urethra. Uh, and there's a differential diagnosis as to what these could be. But again, the vast majority, especially on CT, if you see something that looks like this, will end up being a urethral diverticulum. Talking briefly about urethral tumors, benign tumors of the urethra are very rare. Some can be, you know, we can have a lot of myoma of the urethra. You can have a fiber epithelial polyp of the urethra. Basically, these just look like filling defects similar to the condyloma case on urethrography. And they, like benign tumors of the bladder, uh, 
frequently do need a biopsy to establish diagnosis. In terms of the male urethra, uh, we already talked a little bit about the female urethra, but basically the male urethra, based on where the cancer is, it determines the histological characteristics and most likely histology of the cancer. So you can see here the penile urethra and the bulbomembranous urethra, so the entire anterior urethra, the most common cause, which is 90%, is squamous cell carcinomas. And then prostatic urethra is about 10% of urethral cancers, and that statistically is most likely urethelial carcinoma. And then you can have brand, very rare metastatic tumors of the urethra. But why would we MRI a urethral tumor? It can be useful in extent, evaluating the extent of tumor if you're planning surgery. And in terms of primary urethral tumors, we use the corpus to evaluate the T1 signal, where in tumors it's similar to or lower than the corpus. And then on T2 weighted images, intermediate to low signal, unless there's some inflammation with it, and then usually mildly enhancing. And then alternatively, and this is probably more common, we'll see secondary urethral tumors or tumors of the urethra that come from adjacent organs, and that's bladder, that's cervix, that's vagina, or prostate even. And you can see lymphatic or venous extension, and these often are seen within the urethral lumen with or without extension into the periurethral tissues. But again, on MR, you'd have an idea of, is this a rectal tumor that's just locally advanced? Is this a bladder tumor that's locally advanced? Is this a cervical tumor that's locally advanced? And so that's where MRI can really, can really help with urethral tumors. We're not going to really get into it, but there's a, the T staging and N staging of urethral tumors. T4 is if it invades adjacent organs. T3 typically involves invasion of the corpus, cavernosum, going beyond the prostate capsule, can invade the anterior vagina and bladder neck, and various other types. And then nodes, um, N1 disease is a single nodal metastasis, less than two centimeters in greater, greatest dimension. And N2 disease for urethral cancer is a, a large lymph node greater than two centimeters or multiple lymph nodes. And, and that's just the T and N staging of urethral cancer. Finally, the last thing we'll talk about just with a few minutes left are some congenital urethral abnormalities. And, and so here we have the glands penis outlined actually by contrast that's come out. We have a urethral opening on the undersurface of the glands and we have this, this little track that ends blindly. And the question is, what is the diagnosis? And the diagnosis here is hypospadias, which is probably the most common congenital urethral abnormality. It occurs in approximately one to 200, one in 250 male newborns. It is associated with other urogenital abnormalities, most commonly undescended testicles. Um, the urethral meatus on the ventral surface can be anywhere from the penile shaft to the penoscrotal region. So it can be very proximal or very distal, but basically how it's treated is they tubularize the distal urethra or reconstruct it with a flap or graft. And you can see here, this is an expected post-operative appearance status post hypospadias repair where we have the urethral lumen and then this focal, sort of focal dilation of the anterior urethra where it's been reconstructed. This is just a fascinating case we have one case of here and the patient with a complete urethral duplication. Um, this is a normal urethra with a retrograde urethrogram looking as expected this patient actually had two uh, urethral meatuses so they, they catheterized both and injected both. And this actually, this accessory dorsal urethra extended into a blind ending ejaculatory duct, which is just a very interesting fluoroscopic image. Um, usually the ventral urethra is the functional urethra and contains a sphincter. Um, complete caudal duplications usually result in complete division of the urinary bladder with each half receiving a single ureter. And like many other GU anomalies can be associated with other anomalies such as bladder extrophy. And then the surgical management, impossible to know, everything is complex and tailored to the unique sort of anatomy of each of these patients. So with that, I am finished with a couple minutes to spare. I thank you all for listening. Any questions? I see one question that I was gonna answer, I see here. Uh, how does one differentiate gonococcal infection versus BXO? That can, that can be a challenge. Um, it is typically long segment irregular stricturing. Um, the glands of Latrae are typically not seen with BXO or like like in sclerosis, so that that's one clue, although not, not a mandatory sort of thing. A lot of it just comes from testing. And, and you know, the goal of, of us is not necessarily to always define what is the cause of the urethral stricture, because usually by the time they end up in radiology, the, the question is how extensive is the urethral structure, 
urethral stricture. So thank you. Any other questions? Well, I thank you all for your time and have a great day or evening or whatever time of day it is. <laughs> Thank you so much for that masterful talk, Dr. Gagano. Uh, that was brilliant. We really appreciate you taking the time to join us um, as evidenced by the effusion of wonderful comments here on the chat as well. Um, with that, I believe it's about the top of the hour. Thank you everyone for joining us and have a great weekend.